Hi, uh, my name is Leon Yin. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, this is my first time at Pi Data. Uh, I'm a, a data scientist and a research engineer at NYU's Social Media and Political Participation Lab and the Center for Data Science. And today I'm going to be talking about how to make um, reverse image searches using all out of the box machine learning libraries. And what is a reverse image search? It's sort of like Google's similar images. So say uh, I want to find other golden retrievers that look sad, you could just plug it in and you would get some similar results. So uh, this talk will be talking about kind of how to reverse engineer something similar to that. And so a quick overview of what's going on. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the background about why I'm interested in this problem. I'm going to talk about what is a neural network, how do we use a pre-trained neural network in Keras, and how we find the relationships between them using scikit-learn's k nearest neighbors. And then we'll see if it works, and we'll go over some questions. So a little bit of background, my lab, um, we try to see how people use social media um, for political means, whether that be attending a protest or voting for um, a new candidate. And uh, also we look at how people try to manipulate the media, um, like a lot of what happened during the election. So. Uh, I found that uh, images are a really important source of conveying information, and that's kind of how we express ourselves this time and day and age. My lab mostly uses Twitter data, and we mostly look at just metadata and text, and I kind of wanted to unlock a whole new um, ground uh, area of research using images. Um, so there are two ways, at least that I know, of how to quantify images, and so one would be the reverse image search where you want to find either a duplicate or something that's very similar, and then there are classifiers where if you want a type of thing, say all pictures of dogs or Donald Trump. Um, so we actually discovered one working on number two. So we were building a classifier by fine-tuning a Keras model, and uh, from doing so, it kind of unlocked how to do number one also. Um, so number one's really good for exploratory research or for uh, personal use. So um, if you, you know, uh, th I want to emphasize that this process works with uh, any collection of images. So uh, all the code is available also, and it's on um, GitHub and on my Twitter account, which is just my name, Leon Yin. So if you want to follow along, uh, please do. I'm working to document it a little bit better as well. Um, so uh, the reverse image search, how is this going to work? So at a high level, we're going to leverage convolutional features from a neural network pre-trained on ImageNet. Uh, which uh, I'm sure a lot of you are probably already familiar with, and if you're not, uh, then we'll learn something new. And then we'll calculate the distance between those convolutional features using the k-nearest neighbors algorithm in scikit-learn. So uh, before we get started, um, what's a neural network? So this is an old parable that I really like that describes what a neural network is. Um, so uh, this is an old parable about there's an elephant in a room and a bunch of blind men try to figure out what it is by touching different parts of it. They each have different clues of what they think it is. And I think a uh, neural network is very similar, where uh, you take an input, you transform it into an easily differentiable new output or convolutional features. Okay, and so for anyone who um, wants a less silly example, but still kind of a silly example, uh, uh, neural networks are basically just two things that, that happen in scale, a matrix multiplication, which uh, you could see here with these lines. Uh, those create new features and then thresholding, which uh, amplifies features and mutes ones that are weak. Um, the features then go into different layers and then are combined to create new features. And for anyone who's interested in interpretability, um, everyone always says that you know, neural networks are black box, but there's uh, some good research going on. Uh, specifically, there's this article from Distill, which uh, I'll just uh, say that highly recommend you read, but it basically expresses uh, what is being learned inside of a neural network. On ImageNet, for example, they use Google Net because these are done by some Google brain researchers. Uh, and so if you were to imagine the input being all the way on the left and the output of prediction being on the right, uh, first the model learns edges and then those get combined and they become features, uh, textures, and then patterns, parts, and objects, etc. So uh, check that out. Uh, it's really great. Um, sorry? Uh, distill. It's called uh, distill.pub. Yeah, just Google it. You'll find it. Uh, you can search feature visualization. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a new data set, so end up here the output, but instead of having that last layer, which is simply a regression to make a prediction, 
uh, we're just going to get numbers. And so we're going to use those numbers to uh, essentially find similar images. Uh, and so most of these models uh, have been benchmarked and pre-trained on this data set called ImageNet. It's a, it's a very prolific computer vision data set created uh, at Stanford. And it has about uh, over a million training examples and over a thousand different classes or types of things. So there's a lot of controversy, uh, controversy over this um, data set because it might be missing certain things and it was created uh, in what some consider an ad hoc manner. But right now it is uh, considered a benchmark and it's used to pre-train a lot of different uh, convolutional neural networks because it has a uh, diverse set of different shapes and colors and all the things that uh, you would try to look for if you are training a convolutional neural net. And so I just want to show you how simple it is to implement one of these models. Um, with just one line of code in Keras, you can import it. I'm just telling you the input shape, which is the dimensions of the image I want to feed into it. You have to standardize all the images. We'll go over that. Um, I'm saying that I want to import the image net weights. Um, so it's, this is already trained for probably around a week on image net. And then uh, I'm saying that I don't want the last layer, which is a regression. So whenever I feed something through here, it'll just return uh, new convolutional features and not predictions and probabilities for a thousand different classes. Um, so this is an example of how you can read an image into Python. So uh, you can read images off the web or on disk. I'm in a little convenient function, which I'm, I've hidden called read image. So uh, it just reads in this link of a, uh, a goose that thinks it's a flamingo. And we resize it to 229 by 229, which is one of the um, uh, square sizes that one of these models, uh, specifically ResNet 50, has been pre-trained on. And this is a little pre preview of uh, that wannabe duck, I guess. Um, and uh, one thing to remember is that all these images, they're just matrices that have three color channels, uh, red, green, and blue. So every time you have a JPEG, it's just uh, three color channels in a matrix. Uh, we can convert all images that are like pings and whatnot uh, into this format. And this is the format that the model plays best with. <clears throat> uh, so implementing this is actually pretty easy to get a new f uh, convolutional features. You can uh, instantiate the model using that convenience function we defined earlier. We can use a pre-processing function that Keras has included, which just uh, standardizes the data. Uh, and then we can just predict it using model.predict and get a convolutional feature. And then you can drop the model. And so what we've done is we've taken this data set, uh, this image input on the left, and convert it into a new data set. And this data set is uh, 2,048 uh, features long, I guess would be what you say. Uh, and you can just uh, iron out the extra features to make it flat. And uh, you can all do, you can do this in about five lines of code. So for any given image, you can just transform it like that. Uh, well, it takes a little bit longer than that. Um, specifically, uh, so, uh, you can transform any set of images using this to become 2,000 features, 2,048. And it takes about one to two hours for 1,000 using one NVIDIA GPU. So if you're using Amazon, this will cost you about a dollar or two dollars. Uh, and then you can cache it and save it later so you don't have to keep doing it for the same image every night. Uh, let's take a step back and ask, well, why ResNet 50? And I, I'll briefly explain why, which I think is very important if anyone's trying to use Keras and dive into neural networks. So there are, there are a few other popular implementations that already have been trained on ImageNet and are already pre-made on Keras. And let's just take like one second to look at uh, why ResNet. And I'll tell you why uh, ahead of time. So ResNet is great because uh, it, is, it creates a very information-dense output. So some of the other models, for example, this one, which is for Inception Net, uh, it has uh, 50,000 features, whereas ResNet has tw uh, 2,000. And of those features, um, about uh, 33 are non-zero, and then 67% uh, or so uh, are zero. So they're very sparse. And you can see that this gets uh, pretty out of hand, too, with some, like VGG, for example. Um, has about like 85% uh, features that are zero. And uh, so I just chose ResNet because I didn't want a data set that was super wide. I wanted to keep things as small as I could and have the most information with it. So I don't need all those ones and zeros. Uh, <laughs> some, you know, when you're doing a linear regression at the end, it doesn't really matter. But for me, I just want to store the smallest data set I can. Okay, so after I've transformed all that, all my data, 
um, into convolutional features, uh, I want to cluster them and find the most similar images to a certain anchor image. To do that, we use a fundamental uh, machine learning algorithm called the k-nearest neighbors algorithm. What it does, is, uh, this image speaks for itself. Like, so you have an anchor image or a data point, and then you try to see the closest data points to it by calculating distance. Uh, usually, this is Euclidean distance. Sometimes it's Manhattan distance. Uh, so that's how you find the closest neighbors, and this even works when you have data that has uh, 2,000 dimensions. And so. Um, um, this is the path of the data set that I transformed. Uh, I pretty much had about, uh, in this case, uh, it wasn't 100,000, it was about uh, 40,000 images that I transformed into these convolutional features. Um, what the CSV looks like, I'm sorry I didn't uh, show the head, is that uh, it's about 2,048 just numbers and then the file name. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just reading into memory, I'm getting the file name, and I'm separating out the convolutional features. So we have two, uh, two data sets, uh, two data frames, sorry. One of them is convolutional features, and then another is just a series of file names to keep track of everything. Um, what's interesting is that K nearest neighbors is also lightning fast. So uh, for when I did this with 100,000 images, it took about two minutes. For 40,000, it took like, a, like 30 seconds or so. Uh, one nice thing is that you can parallelize it or distribute it using uh, the end jobs um, argument in scikit-learn, which is really nice. And you can choose what kind of distance uh, calculation you want. I chose ball tree because it supposedly works with a, a wider, more sparse data. Uh, although ResNet is considered uh, compact for other neural networks, I think that 2,000 features is still kind of a lot. Uh, so I chose that. Um, what's interesting too is that if you so chose and you had different data sets of images, you can do k nearest neighbors on all of them, and the distance for that anchor point would be the same for all. So if you wanted to uh, scale this with a lot of different um, collections of images, uh, you could do so, and you could do it across different machines and save them to different k nearest neighbors models. Then you can just serialize it uh, using joblib. And so let's recap uh, everything that happened. Uh, this is in Python form two, which just which uh, I've included in the repo. So you just read images to a NumPy array. You resize and pre-process them. You create a ResNet model. You convert the NumPy images to convolutional features, and then you save those along with file paths into a CSV. And then you send those convolutional features to train a uh, k-nearest neighbors, and then you pickle that. Uh, and so that is available on GitHub. It's about I think 140 lines of code. Uh, and you can just input any list of images that you want and you can convert them. Um, so, well, why would you use it? Let's, let's make sure it works. So, um, let's, let's see what happens. So, um, for reference, the data set that I chose were a bunch of things I scraped from Google Images. Uh, it took about uh, the 100 first images per search query. This was um, completely random. I want to make kind of a random pool, but obviously it's biased to what I think is random. So by all means, like try it yourself and put whatever images you want into it. Um, but I just chose like some random things like foods and like different kinds of trees, people doing weird things and different kinds of memes. And so um, I made a little wrapper function for getting neighbors. So what this does is it uh, you load the two models that we're going to use, one to find neighbors and then another to convert data to find neighbors. Then we convert um, any given input into that format, which can be fed in k nearest neighbors to find relational data sets. We do so up uh, data points and we plot them. And so um, for this uh, duck flamingo, uh, whoops, you can't really scroll down, huh? <laughs> All right, we'll just look at it here. Sorry, folks. Uh, so for the, our, our friend from the past, Duck Flamingo, uh, we see that the closest images to it, uh, you actually find another Duck Flamingo. You find two of them, and you find a whole bunch of other flamingos. Again, this data set's biased because I searched for flamingos, and uh, you found similar things. It's also um, really great for duplicates. So these are two guys playing basketball. We get all the duplicates of them playing basketball, and a few more people playing basketball, community playing a tree. Um, you can see that what they're looking at are, looks like they're looking for people in certain um, stances, perhaps. And there's a lot of greenery I'm seeing. So um, color is definitely an important thing. And one thing that I've noticed a lot is that it, it, Resonance is really great at picking up shapes. 
And what's cool too is if you want something like tweets, which is we get a lot of images of screenshots of tweets, um, you can search for those too and you'll get other things that are also screenshots of tweets and other text, similar things. Um, all right, so let's go back to the official thing. Okay, so some next steps that uh, I'm interested in doing. So right now I'm trying to uh, expand how many platforms I have images of. Right now we started with Twitter. I'm starting to get some of the uh, different parts of the web where a lot of uh, like white supremacists hang out. So I didn't share that on purpose because I don't want to show you guys a bunch of awful images. So that's why I chose flamingos. But uh, we're working on looking at how ideas spread. And a lot of those ideas that are spreading these days are propaganda and toxic and white supremacist ideas. Um, I want to know how to get this to be used by people who aren't data scientists. So uh, although you know, I can create one function that does this, uh, it'd be really nice to have a, have a UI. And I saw a similar one that uh, Ethan, hello, uh, created yesterday. And so um, yes, I will perhaps take some inspiration from that. Uh, so thank you for open sourcing that. Um, and I want to see if analogies work. So uh, we look at memes a lot, so it would be really cool to see if you can multiply these, uh, late, these um, convolutional features into one vector and see what comes out from after that. For example, uh, you know, there's a lot of memes are remixed, so you can put uh, one on one side and one on the other and see if it pops up and you find the remix. Just an idea. Uh, thank you. I will take questions now. Um, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, I've seen this same technique by Ethan and others uh, using the fashion industry, and they also have similar patterns like floral prints. Um, what you could do also is um, have different sizes of images, so perhaps have a zoom in if you want a specific texture. Mm -hmm. But um, one thing that did come out of um, that distill article I showed earlier is that um, these models pay a lot of attention to textures and, and different uh, edges. So uh, I would guess that it could do that. It's, it's worth a try, yeah. yeah. And to try it, it's not very hard. Like you can just use code like this, and it it's about a hundred lines of code. The, the hardest part is configuring Keras and TensorFlow. Um, it can be a little finicky, so I would just um, make sure you do that right. That's the hardest part. Yes. I'm trying to understand the question correctly. Um, so I don't retrain the network at all. I'm just piggybacking on ImageNet. And it's pretty um, representative. It tries to be representative of all the things out there. But there are probably combinations of shapes and things that uh, it hasn't seen. It doesn't know how to categorize. It also just, on the only context it has is an image, too. So if you have two visually similar things, it'll confuse the two. And that can get you in a lot of trouble sometimes. Uh, for example, Google had uh, this thing with a bunch of gorillas, and then it also had pictures of black people because uh, there's no context. And so, if you just look at uh, without context, you know, th I mean, yeah, these data sets are missing a lot, and it's harder to know what it's missing to to f to compensate for that and to make sure that they're fair and accurate. But that's kind of why uh, ImageNet is being. Uh, I don't want to say. Well, that's why people are questioning how good ImageNet is these days and trying to figure out better representations of what is representative. Yes? That's a good question. The question is, how and why did I choose K-nearest neighbors? Um, well, uh, the dumb answer is uh, that it just, uh, seem like the best, simplest answer. 
Uh, and the real answer is that I haven't tried anything else. Um, cosine similarity, similar word vectors would be interesting to look at. I'm really in, I, so I saw a lot of parallels to um, word embeddings like word to vec which create latent representations of text. And I don't think that this is that different from, uh, from, from those kind of latent vectors. So I try out cosine similarity and maybe um, a few more metrics, but yeah. Uh, I chose KNES Neighbors because it could scale well and it was easy to deploy and it's very interpretable. Yes, hi. The question is, uh, how do I validate uh, what comes out? Are there benchmarks? Um, I have not done any of that yet. I would really like to. That's my answer. <laughs> yes? It depends on what you're trying to do. Um, like if you're the case of visual search. Sure. Um, because I've used that, but I don't really see the difference here to do or what's the best practice to do. Sure. Um, yeah, to me, it's just like the visual search is not really that good. Sure. To me, so uh, a lot of times when you normalize, you're actually losing information. And for me, I want to keep all the information. So when you're doing what traditionally, you're right, like you would normalize and regularize the data before the last step, which is the regression. But um, because I didn't have a regression, I just decided to just keep it as is. But I definitely um, toy around with some activation functions for sure. Yeah. Yes. So what is the size of the features you charge from the size? Um, two two thousand and forty eight features per image. Uh, my last remark, if there are no more questions, is that uh, Keras is a really great way to get introduced to neural networks. Uh, but if you're an engineer and you like NumPy, check out PyTorch. It's very intuitive. You can do a lot more with it. Um, I just tried Keras because I was, this, is my first, this was my first exposure to doing neural network stuff. I was doing fine tuning, which, meaning, which means I pretty much did the same thing, but I included the last layer trying to classify something. But uh, PyTorch is really awesome. Um, I suggest checking out Keras, toying around with that, and then check out PyTorch if you're interested in neural networks. <laughs>